Jill Robertson, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I know that you're a principal of landscape architecture at Dialogue, and uh, I've asked you to help me to understand some things around the ecological footprints and uh, what it means. We're taking Michael Sorkin's um, idea uh, from his 250 things an architect should know about how to calculate ecological footprints. Uh, so I thought I would start with just a question about the definitions because there's a couple of words that are bantered around. There's one that's ecological footprint and the other one is carbon footprint. And they're, they're very different, but I'd love to know what your thoughts are on, on what that difference is, if you would. Yeah, for, for me and from my understanding, ecological footprint is a bit of a broader definition and it's sort of the sense of what is the human impact on natural capital. So it looks at sort of many things within the ecosystem, not just carbon. And then the carbon footprint is a bit of a subsect of that, where it specifically looks at the amount of carbon that we use for any given task or activity. So they're both different ways of sort of measuring and, and quantifying human impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. And I know there's um, the ecological footprint, there's actually a calculator that individuals can use. So we might include that with the, with the post that we do. People can calculate their own footprint. I know I just did, and it was fascinating. Um, but I, I want to I want to start with this question of resiliency because I, I guess one of the questions is why do we measure? Why is it important to measure ecological footprints? And what does resiliency have to do with it, or does it have anything to do with resiliency? I think they are intuitively and inherently linked together. I think one of the reasons we started measuring ecological footprint is to help people quantify and understand something that's a bit of an um, ephemeral concept. It's hard, I think, for many people to see the impact that we have on our world, especially from an environmental standpoint. You know, people are just living their lives. And um, so it became a tool that was developed in the late 90s to help people be able to see that every action that we have has a, a reaction and in some cases, an impact on, in most cases, an impact on the environment. And, you know, there's so many people in the world that are data driven and need that sort of tangible data. And so I think that that becomes a really valuable tool for those people to understand, you know, how we're actually changing our world. And in most cases for the negative. Mm -hmm. And then um, that ties into the idea of resiliency because we've started to, to make positive changes. And I think, you and I talked about this earlier, COVID has actually allowed the world to rebound in some respects and for us to be able to see measurable resiliency. Less traffic on the canals in Venice has meant that there have been dolphins. The air quality in the world is generally better because there's less car traffic, less airplane traffic. So we're starting to see sort of the resiliency within the ecosystems rebounding. Right. And, and um, when we think about resiliency, that's a, that's a goal that's probably hopefully never ending for us as, as a human, humans existing on a planet that's kind of got finite resources. Um, but the ecological footprint, uh, is there, and I know you've studied it in environmental science and have a great deal of knowledge about it, but is there a basis of when that came into being or how did the measurements start to come forward? in terms of an ecological footprint? The, the book, I referenced this book. So it was actually written in the late 90s, um, sort of at the tail end of that kind of resurgence of environmentalism. And it, it became, this is really one of the founding documents, I think that speaks to um, how to start quantifying that, that conversation and that reaction. And, um, you know, we've learned a lot since the time that that book has been published. And I think it still is one of those foundational documents, but we see it spinning out into things like the carbon footprint. And now um, this notion of life cycle analysis, where we look at the impacts from cradle to grave, especially around design and construction, and then how that ties into sort of the conversation about resiliency as well. 
So I think this becomes one of those foundational building blocks that's really um, led to a, a generational conversation about our impact on the environment, measuring it, and hopefully changing human action. Mm -hmm. And I know you had sent an image uh, about the carbon, the ecological footprint, and a gentleman's name, Matthias Wagamagel, is on the bottom of that image. Yes. And I started doing a little research about him and, and realized his premise is very much focused on considering physical capital versus financial capital. And this notion of needing to quantify, which you started to talk about, is very interesting in the sense it's... Um, I guess if we have grown away or lost touch from the land and, the, and nature and what it does and its replenishment capacity, then perhaps that quantification can bring us back more in touch with that? Or what, what is your take on why bringing in financial um, analysis in that way? Again, it's something that's easy for people to understand. We learn at a very early age that things cost money. I remember playing with the Fisher Price cash register, you know, probably at the age of two and three. And now I've seen kids now there's a Fisher Price debit machine. Like we teach kids the value of money very early, um, but we don't necessarily teach them how to value, you know, nature and ecology and preservation of wild spaces. And so again, framing up that conversation in terms that most people understand creates a common language and a common space to start talking about that. And that's one of the things that sort of life cycle assessment does is it doesn't, it takes a project beyond the, the capital costs of that moment in construction and, and extends it into the, the value of the materials that went into the construction and also the values of demobilizing or demolishing the building at the end of its life. So again, it's putting everything in the context of uh, a metric to measure that we all understand. Mm -hmm. And it's allowing us to objectively look at what we build and how it affects or blocks certain things. So, exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious to bring in this idea of community uh, well-being. And it's, it's something that uh, your practice has been very involved with. But what's that relationship with community well-being and footprints in your view? I think community well-being becomes a piece that we need to measure that we haven't in the past. And so we're starting to appreciate its value. So from a design point of view, there's costs that go into building a park space and there's values to that. But a lot of those values are intangible and community well-being is one of those intangible values. So if we can start to bring that into the conversation, I think it just creates a more holistic and fully faceted version of the same conversation. And um, a park, for example, may cost X dollars to build, but it could last for 100 years. And it provides a space for people to have access to nature, which we know has a measurable impact on their physical and mental health. It provides spaces for them to recreate, um, to socialize, all of these positive benefits. And if we can start to quantify those in a similar way that we are quantifying natural capital, it starts to put value around that and then lead to, I think, more informed discussions on how we prioritize, um, how we spend our civic money, how we allocate civic space. Yeah. I noticed the government of Canada now has a well-being indicator to some extent. And is that something that's a new initiative or do you have any sense on where that has come from? Yes, I think that's a very new initiative and it is coming out of this uh, somewhat recent recognition that mental health is just as important as physical health. And you can actually measure the health of a city in terms of the happiness of its citizens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this conversation started probably, you know, five or 10 years ago, but I think it's become again, so intensified because of the pandemic, because now we're physically and socially isolated. And there's this tension around balancing physical health with mental health. And, you know, it's really demonstrating that we need to look at what makes our cities well, much more holistically than I think we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So the effects of the pandemic have helped us to rethink in a lot of ways 
How's that changing your design? This is probably the last question, but how is that changing your design thinking right at the moment? Is there anything that's adjusted? We're starting to talk about it, and I think that's going to be the next challenge as designers to face. You know, right away we see changes in that there's an increased demand for outdoor spaces where we can gather and recreate and be social, but in, in a safe and healthy manner. Um, you've seen it in Edmonton with the resurgence of interest and use of the river valley, an increase in bikes an increase in pets. If you want to get a bike or a pet in the city of Edmonton, it's really hard now because everyone has gone and done that. And so that means there's more people out in our parks and open spaces. And so then, you know, do we need to increase the space to accommodate that use? And we've seen that on White Avenue where the patio spaces have expanded into the streets to accommodate increased pedestrian traffic instead of um, the space that was previously allocated for cars. And so hopefully, these changes will become permanent. And in other cities in the world, Paris has permanently turning over some of their roads to pedestrians and cars because we're changing how we use, use this public space. And I think that's gonna be a really interesting conversation going forward. It will be. It's almost been like we've had this pilot. Exactly. Yeah. That's the best way to, to create civic change like this is, is a pilot project and probably the most famous example that I know of is Jeanette City Khan, who piloted the idea of pedestrianizing Times Square in New York City, probably one of the busiest intersections in the world before, and now it's a pedestrian space, and she made that transformation through a pilot project. Yeah, that's a very interesting and, and uh, groundbreaking project, and I think Gal Architects was involved in guiding them in that work. Yeah. So, yeah. Joe, we could keep talking, but this has been a great start, and we'll post some information about calculating our ecological footprints, and hopefully the footprints will go down. Right now, North America, we're quite, we have quite big feet in North America. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully we can work on that. But thank you so much for your time. I appreciate well, thank it. thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Okay. Right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.